Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambu dasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambu dasa. Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchero ye olahudi samyao sambuto she. Namo sadanto suchero ye olahudi samyao sambuto she. Shang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan sao yu. Wo jin qian wan de shou chi yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture. Shifu Shangra and Goe Shishong Dajia Aung Tofu. Delighted to be with you again today on a Sunday to uh, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia. It is October 17th here. It is a Saturday night back in California. Uh, you can adjust the time appropriately wherever you are. Glad you're here with us to look into the Flower Garland Sutras, 10 stages chapter. And we're um, reviewing the first stage. We're in a phase of our lecture process called uh, Sutras as Literature. We're looking at these scriptures one more time. We went through them in a traditional commentarial way, uh, taking apart every line and, and uh, discussing the terms and the context, and language, principles, etc. This time we've got the whole thing in English, which is uh, uh, something to celebrate all by itself. And we're listening to it for the flow of the ideas, the uh, stories involved, the principles and how the uh, flow of the narrative, and there is actually a story, there's a story here in the 10 stages chapter, how that works. It is a conversation between two bodhisattvas um, and one in particular who is explaining kind of like a college professor or uh, it doesn't have to be a college professor, kind of like your instructor, what it means to walk, walk the bodhisattva path. That's the language we use. What it means to develop your character of towards altruism, towards goodness of the heart. Um, in this, I think, doesn't get said enough, in relationship. People often assume that, that Buddhists just try to enter nirvana as soon as possible and kind of leave the world behind. Well, in a way, there's a phase of one's training where you have to see through the emptiness of all conditioned things. You can't be attached to anything, including uh, your life in the world, your relationships, but that's only a phase. That's a uh, training on the wisdom side until the, when the wisdom gets to the ultimate point, then the compassion kicks in. When you realize yeah. that the self that you've been, been pushed around by your whole life, you realize that thing is actually just a Contempor uh, temporary construction, what you realize at that point is the deeper connection between all of us who are being pushed around by the things that we, we create 
uh, that they don't really serve us uh, in terms of, of giving us any more wisdom. So that's the deal. We're in that process of learning the Bodhisattva's education. Uh, this is the 10 stages, which is from the, the point of view of the Buddhist tradition. This is the ultimate expression of the Bodhisattva's education. So uh, let's get going. We can do our request. Oh, actually, um, I have a new way of doing this, which is um, uh, first, uh, what, what I had in mind, I wanted to um, start something that I will continue every time I lecture from here in Australia, which is I want to acknowledge country. And this is a practice that Australians observe whenever there's a public gathering, uh, whenever two or more people uh, gather for, for uh, good works, first thing they do is acknowledge country. And let me just say, as we begin today, I wish to show my respects and acknowledge the land from where I'm speaking and to the Ugambe language group and the Kumbumeri peoples and to pay my respects to the wisdom of their traditions and their elders past, present and emerging. I think that's a very graceful way to open, to say that we are, uh, we're not the first folks here. We are indeed uh, standing on the shoulders of people who've come before us and we want to create uh, a grace and a respect for those who will come after us. So that acknowledgement to country, I think is, is uh, a very wholesome practice. Now, with that in mind, let's go ahead and we're gonna come back to see here, page 50 when we come back. All right. And close this. Navigating around my computer, huh? Here we go. All right. We're going to invoke spiritual presence. Pay our homage to the Flower Garland Sutra of the Buddha's expanded Mahayana teachings and the ocean wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Here we go. Zoom our way back to page 
50. We are looking at the bodhisattva's vows, which is the hallmark of the first stage. We're on the first stage of 10. And our bodhisattva has been, this is called the stage of happiness. And the things that make him or her happy, this is gender neutral sutra text, general, gender neutral scripture. Um, bodhisattva gets happy through a process of giving. And what we're doing here in the first stage is preparing the foundation for everything that follows. This is the groundwork. This is the rebar. This is the, the cement, uh, the two by fours of the Bodhisattva's edifice that he's going to build all the way up to Buddhahood. So it needs to be solid, it needs to be square, geometrically solid so it can hold all 10 stages. And uh, the, the vows, B-O-W, vow, like to make a wish, a promise. Uh, in other words, we have in English like oath, you swear an oath, you sign a contract. That's what we do in the business world, the marketplace, like that. But this is from the heart. This is the Bodhisattva saying, I'm going to do this. And the it's we have people in, in a living tradition of Buddhist practitioners who say that those vows have a way of pulling us back into life after we pass on from one body to the next. The, the, the strength of the mind and the strengthening of the mind, see, the, let's say this, the mind that makes the vows and the vows that emerge have a way of um, acting like a, a rocket. Think of, we recently, uh, uh, we've been paying attention to, to rockets going into orbit or suborbit recently. William Shatner uh, of Star Trek fame recently set foot in space for the first time. Um, these vows are like that. They take off and they carry us beyond one lifetime. Seemingly. So what, what that suggests is how strong is the mind? And we should pay a lot of attention to the thoughts that our minds fix on and place in our hearts and say, this is my new uh, fuel, fuel for lifetimes. This is going to power me through lifetimes. Furthermore, the vows work as compass bearings. This is my direction. I'm going south by southwest. These are the coordinates. Put them in your GPS, you know, because this is where I'm going. That's what vows do. And yet, what are they? Just a thought, like any other. Just a thought. Here's the bodhisattvas making vows. Now, I want to mention, when we get to the refrain, all 10 of these have a refrain that keeps coming back, repeated over and over. And uh, I'm going to, I've got a melody that we uh, are going to sing the refrain and make it easier for us to, to remember. Maybe even the refrains um, have a power of their own. It's sutra text, it's the words of the Buddha through the Bodhisattva Bajra Treasury's mouth. And who knows if we, you never know when those vows emerge, possibly we have made vows to hear the Avatamsaka Sutra in Life After Life. And these refrains, if we chant them, if we just put them in our ear and let them, let them cycle around in the Dharma wheel, uh, they might, you never know what they might stimulate from our deeper, cleaner levels of consciousness. Don't know. So here's the Chinese. We're ready. Ready? Here we go. Yo fa da yuan. Yuan yi che zhong sheng jie. Yo se wu se. Yo xiang, wu xiang, fei yo xiang, fei wu xiang, lan sheng, tai sheng, shi sheng, hua sheng, san jie suo xi, ru yu liu qu, yi qie sheng chu, ming si suo she, ru shi deng, ru shi deng lei, wo jie jiao hua, ling ru fo fa, yong, ling yong duan yi qie shi jian qu, 
令安住一切智智道，广大如法界，久经如虚空，尽为来际，一切界数，无有休息。Okay, there it is. That's a big long vow. Look at that. Here we go. They further make great vows, vowing to teach and transform all living beings, so that they enter the Buddha Dharma and depart from worldly destinies once and for all. So that they dwell in the way of omniscience, this vow includes all the realms of living beings: those with form, those without form, those with thought, and without thought; those neither with thought nor without thought; egg-born, womb-born, moisture-born, transformationally born; those beings bound in the three realms; those who've entered the six destinies. In all such places of rebirth, comprised of name and form, all such categories. And here we go. Vast and great is the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time, throughout all numbers of eons, without cease. That's our. That's where we come in. Here it is. Here's our. Here's our refrain. The Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time. Since we got it running, let's let's try it again. Vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time. Doing that、uh, a couple more times. Now let's take a look. What was that all about? It was about bowing to teach and transform all living beings. Teach and transform. That's a, that's our translated Buddhist lingo. That's our technical term. Jiao Hua in Chinese、It、just means teach. Transform is, I think, really helpful because it it it. It conforms to one of Master Hua's,、uh, our our founder, conforms to one of his earliest epithets, which was, "We all will hear you. You are the sound of the universe shining all over the world." So, Shi、uh, Fu's briefest. Briefest teaching. Somebody came in and said, "Shifu, what is cultivation all about?" Master Hua said, "Everybody must change." That was it. And must must sounds compelling. What、well, that's what cultivation is. I mean, if you go out and plant a garden, you're going to be investing some time and some sweat in making those crops grow. Right. So yeah, once you Say, I really want to use the Buddha's wisdom to become a better person, ultimately to end suffering for myself and others. Yeah, you have to change. Everyone must change. He said. So that's the Hua here. Interestingly, it's also Shen Hua. It's the name that Master the Shifu got 
from his teacher, Master Empty Cloud. That's the second word, Xuan Hua. That's the Hua of transform. So we're, mm, some people have said we need to retranslate Jiao Hua to, to actually um, to get it away from the literal Chinese two words, the Chinglish aspect, Jiao Hua, teach and transform. It just probably means teach. But if we add that little uh, nugget of language there, that that is the, the hua that corresponds to his instructions, everybody must change, then it kind of makes sense. Here is the Bodhisattva's vow to teach, and he means it. He or she um, enters the Buddha Dharma, that is to say, uh, let's go of every place where he or she doesn't correspond to the middle way. If it's not enough, he adds. If it's too much, he cuts back. And they leave. When you do that, when you really, they say, are reborn in the household of the Buddha through a process of cultivation, you no longer fear being reborn out of the human body. Uh, you leave worldly destinies once and for all, probably including being reborn as a god in heaven, right? In the heavens. So they dwell, they abide in the path of omniscience. So all omniscience is called ichijir, wisdom and knowledge that corresponds to how things really are. Hmm. Talk about uh, fake news. Uh, somebody who is abides in the way of omniscience, sees things as they really are. Then look at what happens here. He says, here's who I'm going to teach. I'm going to teach all realms of beings. This is a uh, cosmology. This is a, uh, no, that's not the word. This is what, how do you describe it? Zoology in, is all kinds of animals. Homology, all kinds of humans, maybe that's it. This is talking about all living beings, but it is not human centric. It's not anthropocentric. It's mind centric. Mind puts the mind in the middle, not just humanity. So, how interesting is that? That it's a vision of life itself in all its forms. This is comprehensive. Then we get the list. What does he say? Beings who have form, i.e. bodies. Beings without form. Disembodied beings? What about ghosts? Oh, hmm. Spirits? Hmm. Ancestors? Hmm. But they're not a lot. Well, yeah. So to open up our perspective here. Take a look at a, bit, a wider view. With form, without form. With thought, without thought. Beings without thought. Hmm. Beings who are neither with or without thought. Ah, so the uh, those who love formal logic love the Buddha Dharma because these uh, the Indian tradition is steeped in the tetralemma: yes, no, neither yes nor no, both yes and no. So formal logic, right? Yeah, you with me? <laughs> Did I lose you? Yeah. So this is, this is real stuff. Uh, people who like to use their mind to analyze love the Buddha's teaching. So beings that come in eggs. I had conversations with half a dozen this morning. Beings that come from wombs. I am one of those mammals. Beings that come from moisture. Think about mosquito larvae. Right? Beings that come by transformation. How about butterflies, etc.? Beings bound in the three realms. Mm. Beings who have entered the six destinies. These are categories that we went through in great detail first time we touched this text. Beings in all such places of rebirth with name and form, all such categories. What does the Bodhisattva say? Teach them all. Going to teach them vast and great as the dharma realm all the different probably you could say dharma realms meaning all the places that we can appear this bodhisattva is going to take them all on 
ultimate is empty space to the ends of future time throughout numbers of eons without cease, without cease, without cease. So big job, right? That's the size of the Bodhisattva's heart. Here, because it's so specific, you really get a sense of what the scale of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition holds. It's not just one gender of people who look like me or heard my story, right? So many religions have to do with one founder's story. That's what you devote your entire life to. This is big and big and big and includes all those stories. So um, one of the things I want to share today is we have embarked on the next iteration of the Parliament of World's Religions. Parliament of World's Religions is uh, a great idea. And the Parliament, the plenary session just concluded for today. And of course, like most things in 2021, it's virtual, it's online. Um, I have had the blessings in my life of attending the parliament in 1999 in Cape Town, South Africa, and a parliament in 2004, was it? In Barcelona, Spain, uh, and or Catalonia, depending on how you split it. And a parliament in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, 2009, and then a parliament in Salt Lake City in uh, 2012, no, 2015, 14. Um, and and uh, I missed the parliament in Toronto, but here we are. Um, I'm appearing in the parliament tomorrow on a panel. And uh, it's, if you're in Australia, it's 4 a.m. If you're in the US, it's do the math. Uh, when is that? The thing about the parliament is you have to register and you pay. It's not for free, uh, which I suppose the parliament needs that. Let's see here. 4 a.m. Here is 11 a.m. So it's 11 a.m. in California tomorrow. So I'm in a panel with uh, interfaith friends called Grassroots Interfaith, Past, Present, and Future. So what is this about? Um, and why am I talking about the parliament? It has to do with living beings. One place that living beings come together is religion. And I heard a statistic just now. Well, by the way, this morning, I got to listen to Dr. Jane Goodall give a, such an inspiring speech. She spoke from England. And uh, if there when you list uh, women leaders, let's say 10 women leaders who are the most inspiring uh, still living or in the last century, Jane Goodall's name appears. Absolutely, it does. She has inspired more young women to challenge the idea that girls don't do science. Oh, she's uh, those pictures of her as a young uh, researcher. Uh, investigating chimpanzees down in Gombe, Africa, you know, just so incredible. And her research was real. She is still the thing she has, she taught us about how animals uh, are individuals, how animals have feelings, how animals have thought and relationships uh, and cares so similar to ours. That's Jane Goodall. So she just spoke just uh, two hours ago at the, the plenary session of the parliament. She encouraged everyone to eat a plant-based diet. And she encouraged everyone to get a vaccine uh, course, one or two or a booster as well. Uh, so powerful. Um, what a kind-hearted woman. She, she, she uh, said the two problems besetting the world now that everyone needs to pay attention to, the most important problems besetting the world, is human caused climate change and loss of biodiversity. Um, what I mean by that is 
just look at the weather, weather patterns uh, where fire and water are out of balance. And then look at the food in your kitchen and understand that uh, depending on where you live, probably 60 to 70% of that food came from pollinated plants that bees had to do something with. Bees pollinate so much of the food that we eat and bees are under threat. Um, understand that uh, amphibians, frogs, for example, here in Australia, have experienced an incredible sudden decline uh, that amphibians are a food source for much of what holds together the, uh, the smaller substrata of life in your country, in your neighborhood. And you pull any piece of it away and it collapses, the whole structure collapses. So this is what Jane Goodall, was talking about. She said the loss of biodiversity. Currently, interestingly, uh, this is to step out one step further from our sutra, but we're talking about living beings here in the sutra. We want to apply it to our real lives. Currently, uh, people who pay attention to the first major concern that Dr. Goodall raised um, is uh, there's a climate conference coming up in Glasgow in a few weeks uh, where the entire world will be there talking about the challenge in front of humanity now. But currently, right this minute in China, there is a conference on biodiversity, which is getting very little press, but the, the Chinese are leading the way in saying this, we must pay attention. Here in Australia, the loss of species is, they say, at a, at a rate higher than many other nations in the world. Um, koalas, currently there are something like 7,000 koalas left in the wild, they say, or maybe between seven and 10,000. And they are here on the roads, right? Just minutes from where I'm sitting. Koalas are, uh, this is the spring, it's mating season. And everywhere uh, on the road, there are signs saying, drive slowly, drive mindfully because koalas are crossing the road and they are endangered, you know? So in our lifetime, we, if things don't change, the, the species that are the actual fabric of our lives, the food that we eat, the, uh, uh, the, the, what you see under your feet, insects, for example, um, We've been talking about this for several years back. Studies have shown that the biomass of insects, the bugs that in the summer uh, land on your windshield and on your car's bumper grill, they have been decimated to 80%, 90% in continental Europe of these insects are just simply gone. And all the animals that depend on them for food have nothing to eat, they'll go. And then we have... Rachel Carson's Silent Spring that was written about another problem, which was pesticides and DDT. But anyway, so currently humanity, Parliament of World's Religions, people are raising their voices about biodiversity loss and climate change, human caused anthropogenic climate change. We're also talking about uh, the uh, Climate itself in, in Glasgow, the conference that's coming up, a global climate conference, and currently in China, sponsoring a biodiversity conference. So it's a good time for people to come together to start looking at these problems. It's maybe our last chance. That was another point that people made is we're not going to get many more chances. We heard also from His Holiness, the Pope, uh, uh, spoke from, uh, had a, a message read and very articulate, very concerned, raising the very same issues. Um, so this is uh, the Parliament of World's Religions is happening now and uh, will be happening this weekend. And it's a chance for religions to speak to each other and to, to their followers about these major issues. Alrighty, 
What's next? What's living beings? I can read another one here. Ready? Yo fa da yuan yuan yi che shi jie guang da wu liang su xi luan zhu dao zhu zheng zhu ruo ru ruo xing ruo qu ruo di wang chi bie cha bie shi fang wu liang zhong zhong bu tong zhi jie ming liao xian qian zhi jian guang da ju kong ah sorry guang da ru fa jie 究竟如虚空，尽未来际，一切结束，无有休息。They further make great vows, vowing that their wisdom will understand all worlds clearly, that they will perceive those worlds directly. Those worlds will be vast, great, and limitless, gross, subtle, or chaotic, upside down, right side up, whether coming, moving, or going. With distinctions like chakras net in the ten directions, in limitless dissimilar varieties, vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of the future, throughout all numbers of eons, without cease. Hmm, starting to catch that right as it comes by. Here we go. <laughs> Vow to understand and to see all worlds, vast and great as the Dharma, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time, throughout all numbers of eons, without cease, without cease. Without seas, one more. Do it again. Vast and great as the Dharma, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time. Throughout all numbers of eons, without seas. Without cease, without cease. Kind of helps it go home, I guess. Yeah. So here we have worlds. When you when you hear this, this is our we're reading for sutra as literature, right? When you hear this, it's hmm, it's different. Ah,、uh, the bodhisattva is concerned. He's making a vow. He's going to teach. And now he's making a vow that he's going to be able to see all worlds. Their wisdom will understand all worlds clearly, and they'll perceive these worlds directly. Now, this is、um, this is deep, yeah, deep. You could,、um, if you were a science fiction guy, a girl. This is where. People talk about、uh, parallel universes. The whole the whole world of science fiction is you either you're interested and you like it or you totally doesn't doesn't do it for you. But the world of、uh, manga, Japanese comic books,、um, poses different worlds. Anime. Japanese cartoons, different worlds.、Um, if you pay attention to popular culture in the last couple decades, American mass entertainment has been populated by zombies and、um, who else? Zombie zombie outbreaks. And、uh, vampires, and superheroes, and superheroes need supervillains, and these are parallel worlds. So when you think of it that way, why why are are we so obsessed with zombies? Is that people really concerned that that's a possibility? You know, we won't we won't argue that one right now, but it's not so far. Off 
to say the bodhisattva wants to see what does it say their wisdom will understand all worlds clearly they will perceive those worlds directly what are you talking about when you say well i got a plan tonight i'm going to tune into netflix and do uh watch uh a world a movie where uh there's a virus that turns people into flesh devouring brain eating zombies that's what I'm going to watch. The Bodhisattva says, I want to be able to see vast, great, limitless, gross, subtle, chaotic, upside down, right side up, coming, going, moving worlds with distinctions like chakras net. This, by the way, footnote, footnote, for those of you paying attention, this is one of the few places in the sutra where Indra's net actually is mentioned. We always hear about Indra's net and people go, oh yeah, yeah, that's so neat. The idea that you, you know, pearls in, a, in a, the knot of each net and you can see through one pearl all of them and a single pearl gathers them all back and and where's that from well it's sort of from the avatamsaka sutra like this but it's not specifically mentioned if you go looking through the avatamsaka with uh, uh, a search you want to find indra's net it's it's not directly mentioned but it is in other commentaries and other texts, they say, oh, sure. You know what that is? That's just one of the decorations, one of the blessings of if you're God on high, Chakra Devanam Indra is the God of the heaven of the 33 sages, 30, Sattras, 33 sages, 33 gods, the heaven of the 33 gods. One of the decorations, one of the things that comes, the perks of being born reborn as chakra is you have a palace in front of the palace you got this net and it's brilliant because every single pearl perfect pearl reflects the light of all the other pearls and each individual pearl gathers back the entirety so from one to the many one many like that so that's uh part of the avatamsaka that's not specifically mentioned in the avatamsaka hmm. but Parallel worlds. Huh? Here it is. You like zombies? You like the Twilight series? Vampires? Hmm. Science fiction? Talking about Star Wars? Hmm. In a galaxy far, far away. That deep voice. Here we are. Bodhisattva says, yeah. Not only that, not only do they exist, I'm going to see them all. I want to, I vow that I will see them and understand them so that what? So that when the Bodhisattva goes to teach, goes to rescue, he or she has a firm grasp on ultra reality, not only reality, but ultra reality. It's reality that now this is, you know, here's where we go every time we've been saying this since we started lecturing the, on the Avatamsaka's 10 stages, that this is not science fiction. This is a description of a potential in your mind right this minute, in my mind right this minute, that is simply waiting for us to boot up like a new piece of software on your hard drive that you enrolled in a... Uh, online academy to learn how to do it. You paid your $17 at the sale to, to take the, the, the 20 lesson course on how to operate that software. Yeah, that's in us just like that. You just have to cultivate the virtue and practice the samadhi until this wisdom arises. And it's there. It's all, all of these are there. That's, that's a, a founding understanding of this entire text that we're looking at is you've got all of it. I've got all of it. But we have to xin jie xin. You have to believe it. You have to understand how to do it. You have to put it into practice. And after you do that, you get the zheng, the realization of it. It's all there. So, hmm. Ability to see all worlds. 
One more. Let's do another one. Do three today. Yo fa da yuan. Yuan yi qie guo du. Ru yi guo du. Yi guo du. Ru yi qie guo du. Wu liang fu du. Pu jie qing jing. Guang ming zhong ju. Yi wei zhuang yan. Li yi qie fan nao. Cheng jiu qing jing dao. Wu liang zhi hui zhong sheng. Ah. Did I get that right? Wu liang zhi hui zhong sheng. Chong man qi zhong. Pu ru guang da zhu fu jing jie. Sui zhong sheng xin er wei shi xian. Qie ling huan xi. Guang da ru fa jie. Jiu jing ru xu kong. Jing wei la ji. Yi qie jie shu. Wu you xiu xi. They further make great vows, vowing that all countries will enter one country, and that one country will enter all countries, that limitless Buddha lands will everywhere be made pure. Multitudes of adornments made of radiant light will adorn them, that they'll be free from all afflictions, that they will accomplish the way of purity, that limitless wise living beings will fill these worlds. They vow that these beings will all enter the Buddha's vast great states, that they will appear in accordance with the minds of living beings, making them all happy. Vast and great is the Dharma realm, ultimate is empty space, to the ends of future time, throughout all numbers of eons, without cease. Want to sing it again? Let your right brain activate what you just heard about countries. So all countries will enter one country. Let's let's do let's take one more time. One more time. What is it? Having to do with countries. One country will enter all countries. Limitless Buddha lands will be made pure. Adornments of radiant light will make them beautiful. They'll be free from afflictions. Wow. They'll accomplish the way of purity. Limitless wise beings will fill those worlds. And that. Those beings will enter the Buddha's states, that the Bodhisattva will be able to appear according with living beings' thoughts and will make them happy. How about that? So what is this? This is a vow for pure lands. Ah, uh, okay. Future time throughout all numbers of eons without cease, without cease, without cease. Right. So the Bodhisattva is into making pure lands. That's what he's about, just like Amitabha. And what is this? Uh, you know, what's your neighborhood like? Uh, are you all wearing masks? Are you able to gather without fear? Are you having uh, fist fights in your elementary school because somebody doesn't like the fact that your child wore a mask? What's, what's your world like? How's the water there? Can you, is there water to drink? Um, in LA for years, you had to buy bottled water. Sparklets, the sparklets trucks would go through the streets. It's all those bottles. Um, what's the air like? Can you breathe? We've had uh, spare the air days in the Bay Area that you really, you know, you wake up and your eyes hurt because of the smoke. And the smoke was launched from a, forest fire 400 miles away but it turns the air yellow brown what's what's your world like hmm. what's in the grocery stores is it dead flesh do you uh you walk by that meat counter and 
you know they need refrigeration because if that if that meat that's there on display those bodies are living beings that used to belong to to families if if they were out on the counter overnight you wouldn't want to eat it it would spoil so yeah yeah what's your world like the bodhisattva is going to make a better place that's what he wants to do this is, these are these are serious idealists talk about uh, a mind that turns towards altruism, a mind that is benevolent, a mind, a heart that is bent on generosity to the, to the point that they are planning this environmental engineering, social engineering, so that they want to build an entire world from the mind that when you live there, you're always happy. And I would, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would propose to you, why not? Why not? Would you rather spend your time grubbing for money? Yeah, a lot, most of us, enough, need enough to do, so we're not oppressed by hunger and thirst and we have some choices. If you have more money, you have more choices. But at a certain point, accumulating resources kind of loses the point if the happiness is gone because we had to search for resources more and more and more and more and more and more you don't seem like that's you got you missed the answer bodhisattva says happiness here is the answer for not just for me and people who look like me it's not a shrinking pile of wealth it's not a pie that you have to cut. And as soon as this bigger piece goes to that person, you have less. It's not that. It's not a zero sum world. The Bodhisattva wants it for everyone. And I would say, why not? Why not? Why do we have to pull back our vision of how we would want a world to be simply from lack of imagination? Bodhisattva here says, no. I want to be able to make countries in all those worlds that I see completely responsive to living beings' thoughts in a way that makes them happy. Okay, some people will say, well, but you know what makes me happy is all the money in the world, even yours, right? No, this is not, as uh, Gandhi has said, the world has enough to meet everyone's need, but never enough to meet everyone's greed. So this is, has to work for everyone. So no individual can accumulate enough, so much that others are lacking, right? That's the difference. So, and yet every kid knows that. We all know. We all know when someone reaches over and takes my share of pie i'm not happy i cry right maybe reach out and hit them and mom or dad says give it back right? we know we know when we've taken more than our share but somebody tells us that's okay you can you don't have to wait in line you can have yours without sacrificing what everyone else has to pay yeah, and that's, that sets us on the road to greed. So anyway, there you go. Bodhisattva here in the Avatamsaka Sutra is making vows to create a world that is perfect for everyone where suffering doesn't exist. How about that? Yeah, I, I don't know. That's just the, the idea that this kind of... Um, Dreaming is right built right into the sutra, and it's available for everyone. It's not the case that the, the enemies of the Israelites have to be kept away. Um, the, it's not the case that only half of the species, the male half, gets the good stuff. Everybody gets the good stuff. Why not? Why do we have to 
curtail. Well, you're just not realistic. Uh, define reality. Hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Um, wanted to shift just a little over to um, the the we talked about living beings first. The Bodhisattva wants to know all those living beings. And we mentioned that living beings often organize. One place we meet is around religions. And religions are stories. Someone saw the way to get to heaven and told us that story. And we wanted to do it too. So we followed that story. We adopted that story into our, into our belief system. So I think all religions essentially, including Buddhism, come from stories. Now, in human history, when those stories conflict or collide, when someone says, I don't believe that, and as a result, conflict arises, that's been the story of humanity for a very long time. But in 1893, at the Columbian Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair, the first parliament for world religions was held. Uh, the, 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 the Chicago World's Fair, 1893, had many, many, many um, parliaments. That was how it was arranged. They had the parliament of industry and they had the, par the parliament of commerce. And, you know, World's Fairs used to be big deals. They were awarded to uh, certain cities and certain countries and the whole world came and it was exciting because you got to before the internet, uh, you didn't know, you'd never seen all these ways of being alive as a human. Well, the parliament of world's religions was one of the parliaments tucked away at the Chicago fairgrounds, tucked in the corner. And what was unique about this was, this was the very first time that representatives of the world's religions came on their own to speak on their own behalf. Prior to that, uh, so-and-so missionary who had been out to uh, study the, the savage native uh, or the, the, uh, the exotic Hindu uh, had come and reported about what they saw. And everyone said, wow, you saw their photos. This for the very first time, here were representatives of the world's religions. Swami Vivekananda came to talk about the Vedanta style of Hinduism. Oh my goodness. His speech in Chicago was electrifying. Ah, he was such a charismatic, handsome, well-spoken erudite. Brothers and sisters of the world's religions, I greet you, he said. Oh. And the first time there was 400 people in attendance. When he spoke again, there was a thousand people. He was just, Swami Vivekananda was just, just so captivating. Anyway, 1893 was the first one. A century later, again in Chicago, 1993, they said, let's do that again. That was great. So they did a second parliament. And then after that, six years later in Cape Town, South Africa, they said, we need to move the parliament. Uh, off the American continent. It's, it's not only you know, world's religions. So they announced that it was going to be held and uh, Master Hua uh, encouraged uh, us to take part in gatherings like this. He was among the first to do so. And so in 1999, uh, I traveled with a colleague, John Zhu, uh, to Cape Town, South Africa, for the third parliament of the world's religions. And uh, I had an experience there, which I want to share. Um, first of all, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about um, interfaith and the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Let me share some photos here. Uh, Let's just bring it right up here. Why not? The Institute for World Religions was a big part of Master Xuanhua's um, vision for how to bring the Dharma to the West. And what he said was, we're the new religion. 
we're the new kids on the block. Ben, you want if you come around, you can take a look. Is that comfortable? So otherwise, you want to see these photos here. Pull that chair up here. There we go. So the Institute for World Religions in Berkeley was 1995 when Master Hua's vision first appeared, first manifested. We have our uh, this is Sherpa's vows to uh, to bring the Dharma to all living beings, right? This was, here was a moment. This was his meeting with Paul Cardinal Yeevan, 1977 in Los Angeles. Uh, I was present. I think that might be my photo, if I'm not mistaken. But these are two leaders of two of the world's great religions coming together. And they both grew up in the same hometown in Manchuria. So that was kind of the, uh, um, the context for Buddhists to get involved. And, uh, Master Hua's legacies included interfaith cooperation. Um, Institute of World Religions was established here at, the, at the, uh, the former Church of the Nazarene in downtown Berkeley, California, um, just uh, down the block from the police station, down the block from the main library, down the block from the YMCA, dead center, just around the block from the post office, right there, there it is. So this is, became the Institute for World Religions at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And uh, we, I'm gonna slide right through a lot of these slides. I want people to see the photos. Uh, we lectured on a lot of texts over the years since 95, all these different texts. Um, we have stained glass windows, Guan Yin Bodhisattva stained glass. Um, we have uh, interfaith, Peace Walks. This is Bishop William Swing, who just this morning, two hours ago, addressed the Parliament of World Religions live. He's uh, now in advanced age and still going strong, founder of the United Religions Initiative. Um, here we were at Cape Town, Parliament of World Religions. Nelson Mandela, got to see him, got to hear him. What a hero. Uh, United Religions in Salt Lake City in 2002. Uh, I'll point to this young man right here is now Bhikshu Jin Chuan, who may speak with us this afternoon right there. Yeah. Uh, here we are at in Rio de Janeiro in 2003, Global Council meeting, meditating uh, at Flamingo Beach with young Muslims, young Hindus, young Buddhists, young atheists. Uh, the Parliament of Barcelona, Spain. Look at that. By golly, some friendly faces. This is this young man is now a Buddhist monk in the Theravada tradition. Oh, we're having lunch in Barcelona, courtesy of the Sikhs. People will never forget the hospitality of the Sikh community. Fed 10,000 people three meals a day for a week. And that was just the group, the Sikhs from Birmingham, England, came over. If they, the London Sikhs could have fed the world. Touring through Paris. Chan Zen, Buddhist Catholic, 2002. These are all Catholic monastics and priests and laity, meeting with Buddhist priests, monastics, and laity, the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Chan Zen Catholic, this is our Catholic bishop, now the Bishop of Santa Fe. Uh, local Buddhist Catholic down at Mercy Center in Burlingame, California. Uh, the Zen Center of San Francisco, again, there's Bishop Wester. So long history, contemplation of the city, monastics and lay contemplatives from Incarnation Monastery in uh, Berkeley, California. Monks in the West. This is a global monastic interreligious dialogue. Uh, imminent guests, musicians from China visiting Berkeley Monastery. Dressing the uh, American Federation of Muslims of India. Uh, Professor Houston Smith giving the Shrenma Memorial Lecture, Professor Henry Rosemont. So just to say, here's Houston Smith and Henry Rosemont. Just, we've been active. URI Global Council, who are nuns leading women in religion seminar, our publications, Religious East and West. 
um, colleagues and friends who have gathered around interfaith. This is Chancellor Tian Chang Lin, the Chinese Chancellor of University of California, Berkeley, meeting Master Hua. There we are, special man. Dr. Snezhana Akunar, Chancellor of Dharma Buddhist University, Doug Powers and friends, Mari Verhoeven, Houston Smith, uh, our nuns from East and West. Uh, Nirmala Deshpandi, a member of parliament, a peacemaker, someone who upset the apple cart every chance she got. Bhante Shila Vimala, Ajahn Amaro from Sri Lanka and from Thai traditions. Dr. Glenn Booker, the GTU president. And this is what I wanted to share, especially. On the left is Joanne Shenandoah. On the right is her daughter, Leah. Uh, we sponsored them for house concerts at Berkeley and at the Pacific School of Religion. Joanne is the granddaughter of Chief Shenandoah of the Iroquois Nation, the people of the Longhouse, the Haudenosaunee. She's particularly from the Wolf Clan. And uh, Joanne has become a friend. And uh, she is currently experiencing some bad health. So I'm going to be transferring merit at the end as well for Joanne. But if we can take just keep uh, Joanne in mind. And I have a story to tell about the parliament at Cape Town. And uh, the, the third parliament of world's religions, and this is people are saying, why are you off on this? The answer is because uh, we're celebrating the parliament today. Today was the opening plenary, the next two days. It's online, it's virtual still headquartered in Chicago, but it's worldwide. I will be speaking uh, at 4 a.m. here in Australia, but it's gonna be, uh, um, what did I say, was it 9 a.m. Uh, in California. In 1999, just before Y2K, people remember what that was about, um, Professor Houston Smith brought 30 Native American chiefs, representatives, spokespersons, men and women, to Cape Town, because why? Native Americans had never been invited to have a place at the table uh, where religions spoke to each other. And uh, Houston Smith was uh, an activist for, and a historian and a writer about religions. And he invited them, said, the world wants to see you now. And sure enough, uh, of all the representatives uh, of the 300 some religions, the Native Americans were the ones everybody wanted to meet because we'd only seen them on the silver screen chasing after cowboys or being chased by cowboys. And people wanted to meet real first persons, first, na first nations of America. So there we were, the plenary session, opening night at the Parliament of World's Religions. 10,000 people gathered at this campus called Cape Technicon, a university uh, campus. And the, uh, the MC from Chicago, the parliament office opened up and said, uh, it is our particular honor tonight to have among us Native American representatives. I would like to ask the elder Herman Nagoyo to come out and uh, lead us our first chant. So please everyone, you know, take your seat and be quiet. And we'll ask uh, elder Herman Nagoyo. So Herman Nagoyo comes out. He is from the uh, uh, Hopi and uh, so the Southwest America, he comes out with his daughter and his wife. And uh, Herman's an old gentleman with glasses, you know, and kind of comes out and, and he says, well, we'll do some chanting in our traditional language. And he plays in his, his, his uh, whistle and uh, chants a little. And then he says, and now I would like to bring out the voice of Native America, Miss Joanne, uh, Joanne Shenandoah, he says. And out comes this young woman wearing buckskins she has this guitar, this black guitar, and she stands at the microphone and I can see a tear coming down her face. And uh, she says, uh, I've, got the, I've got her quote, I wanna read it, do it justice. Uh, Joanne says, the, uh, the quote goes, She says, we are now reminded to be aware of our place upon this earth and to fulfill our obligations 
to ourselves, our families, nations, our ancestors, and to the natural world. The words say we are to awaken, stand up and be counted, for we are being recognized in the spirit world. She said, and oh, everybody's like goosebumps, you know. So she sang the prophecy song, and uh, Joanne has one of those voices. It's kind of like a, a blanket on a cold night. You just feel embraced in this voice. And the spiritual energy that she invited into that place with 300 different religions, Nelson Mandela, you know, Dalai uh, Lama, and others, all there, carried the collective energy up and up and up and up. And, and I felt so proud to be an American when this is the quality of our spirituality. I just elbowed the guy and I said, wherever she's from, I'm, I'm part of that too. <laughs> We're together and is there, this is how America celebrates spirituality. And uh, later I had a chance uh, to ask her, I said, Joanne, why were you crying? She said, as I looked out at the thousands of religious leaders and representatives of over 300 different religions, spiritual expressions, and indigenous traditions, I realized this was the first time that Native Americans had ever been invited to a place at the table. And perhaps the first time that people had actually met Indians who weren't being chased away by cowboys on a movie screen. And I was aware of the gravity of that moment. That's what she said. So uh, that's one of those moments from the parliament of world's religions. Um, just a wonderful gathering. Uh, this particular photograph is special because we have here uh, two uh, Taiwanese American Buddhist girls, one um, Jordanian uh, Islamic girl, and one uh, young American Catholic girl who have swapped their robes. The Jordanian Muslim is wearing a Buddhist robe and she loaned the other three girls some hijab to see what it was like, an interfaith fashion show. Muslims and Buddhists trading robes and becoming sisters in religion. Brian Conroy, leader of our Buddhist storytelling circle, uh, going strong. How old were you there, Brian? That's younger, right? Younger, that's right. Uh, we have our volunteers putting our uh, lectures out to the world. Indeed, at the Berkeley Monastery, there we are. So just to say how special is uh, this parliament event. And uh, I was joined, I was invited to uh, sit in um, a group that met every week for a year to create the United Religions Initiatives Purpose, Preamble, and Principles. United Religions is a parallel organization to the parliament, a sister and brother organization that now includes uh, 1,080 smaller units called Cooperation Circles at work in over 111 countries. That is the grassroots interface. I'll be talking about this tomorrow. What we came up with, uh, inspired by a man named D. Hock, who invented the Visa card. Visa cards are little individual units. You can make a Visa card wherever you are. You know? So this is the Bishop William Swing, the founder of the URI, invited D. Hock to help us create this. So uh, what we came up with after a year was the United Religions Initiative is a growing global community dedicated to promoting enduring daily interfaith cooperation, ending religiously motivated violence, and creating cultures of peace, justice, and healing for the earth and for all living beings. That was it. That's what it, what uh, a year of good-hearted people coming together once a week created. So interfaith is alive and well. Um, we have 
uh, the, the promise is that religions can cross their boundaries to do something good. It's time. Uh, politics is tearing us apart at the moment. Uh, certainly in the United States, speak for that. Um, it's really time to look elsewhere, other places where people come together to get the resolve and to get the unity and to find a leadership and the harmony and the will to save the human species and the other species on the planet. Honestly, uh, in my darker moments, uh, when I'm not speaking at the bully pulpit that I have with this microphone here, I th think, you know, if humanity disappears, the other species will do fine. They'll be right back. You know, it's, it's our influence that's killing them off. Uh, I'm, I'm not that concerned. They say extinction, but uh, the Maumee River, once we stop my hometown of Toledo, Ohio, once we, we shut down the factories that were pouring raw sewage into the Maumee River, uh, the city government of Toledo, together with the local media, the television and radio, uh, actually did it. They cracked down. They said, you cannot, do we own the river together. It is our collective treasure. You, for your private profit, Mr. Industrialist, are no longer allowed to pollute it, to ruin it for everyone. So they did. Everyone got on board. They, re they recruited the industrialists. And after 10 years of stopping the dumping of pollutants, the fish were back, the amphibians were back, the birds were back, the water was clean, you could swim in it, you could boat in it, you could picnic on the banks without fear of being, you know. So nature forgives when humanity can put it together. So, yeah. Uh, a moment from the United Religions Initiatives uh, history. Uh, this was back in, must have been 2002 or something like that. There was a Silicon Valley entrepreneur who had a training session for CEOs. He wanted to, uh, to train young CEOs and to bring, show them how to expand for the 21st century. This was held at Stanford. And uh, he wanted to bring them up to speed on the potentials for religious diversity in the workplace. You're going to have lots of different religions there. So he contacted the United Religions up in, in San Francisco. And the URI office uh, called me and three other people and said, you have a minute to go, you have an afternoon to go down to Palo Alto to Stanford to, uh, to help this, uh, this CEO who wants to teach diversity among religions. So Rita Semmel was there. Rita was the chairperson. She was a retired journalist representing Judaism. And she wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle, along with her husband back then. And uh, Father P. Gerard O'Rourke, Roman Catholic priest. They call him the Irish Catholic priest from central casting. He just looks, totally looks the part of a Catholic priest and talks like one. You know? And also Iftikhar Hai, who was a uh, representative of the United Muslims of India, everybody's kind of favorite uncle, Uncle Iftikhar, and myself. So we, the four of us took the stage, there was a hundred uh, budding CEOs out there in the audience. And we talked, shared stories the way we do, we start our jokes. We've been working together as this pioneering interfaith endeavor for a decade. And uh, came time for Q and A. And uh, one of the CEOs in the front row said, you know, maybe, here, here in San Francisco, this is the water you all swim in here. But I'm just not used to seeing monks in robes joking with Catholic priests and collars or Jews and Muslims sharing the same stage like old friends. How is this possible? He said. Father Jerry uh, P. Gerardo said, well, he said, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have dreamed that I could be sitting in this chair. He said, I'll spare you all the accent. But uh, Father Jerry was the whole package. He says, but I've changed my way of seeing the world. My eyes have been opened, he said. Interfaith has expanded my heart back to its normal size, not the shrunken, narrow exclusivity that dogma forces upon us. I'm never going back if going back means closing my heart 
to my Buddhist, Jewish, and Muslim friends. He said, take a good look because our planet in the 21st century, if it's going to thrive, will do so because of one word, relationships, relationships, relationships. He said, this is a Kairos moment. Recognize the moment and stand up. The Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad would have been friends. What's wrong with their followers? He said. <laughs> Thank you, Father Jerry. So it sounds a lot like Joanne Shenandoah. We must stand up because we're being recognized in the spirit world. She said. Hallelujah. Bodhisattva. So uh, I'm, let's see now. I don't know if, let's see if we got our, uh, we do. The Berkeley Monastery is online. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to add two songs then go right into the mantra to dedicate merit. So I'm going to ask our spokesperson at the Berkeley Monastery at this point to share with us whatever you have any news from the Berkeley Monastery. Is that uh, Jin Chuan or Jin Wei Shi are you there? Maybe I'm too early. Hello, Jar Master. Oh, Hi Hello. there. Hello, sorry. Yes, um, we're, we don't have any actual new events right now. We have a regular schedule going on here. Okay, that's that's so, worthy of note, worthy of, of of comment. So let me I'll bring it up here. Yeah, and let so people know schedule what they can do. So we still have morning chanting four a.m. every day, and our meditation is six fifteen to seven fifteen, and we have a Dharma reflection seven fifteen to seven thirty. If you want to follow what's been going on for our retreat, we often share about what's going on then. Seven thirty mm -hmm. to eight, we have three steps, one bow. And every day right now, oh, I just changed the time there. Um, from 12 to 12.30, um, Jing Forsher will be leading recitation. So tomorrow, 12 to 12.30, Jing Forsher will be leading recitation. Evening ceremony at 6.30 to 7.30. And at 7.30 to 7.50, we have the heart mantra. Um, on the evenings of uh, Friday, Saturday, we have lectures at BBM. And on the other evenings, other teachers are hosting their own events like Steven Tanner on Wednesday night. Um, who else? Uh, Doug Powers will have one else on Wednesday night. I'm sure Foster has a number of talks during the, the afternoons. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Gene Forger has a sutra lecture on Thursdays on the Infinite Life Sutra. So you can uh -huh. find all the information there on that website that we're sure is showing. Otherwise, hope you can join us. And wish everyone That's well. Great. Where, where are you speaking from right now? <laughs> We're actually on our way to Rubber Vihara. <laughs> so you're you're in a vehicle. You're somewhere on I'm highway. In a vehicle, world. yeah. We're, we're highway. Almost, yeah, we're on the highway. All right. Well, you're right. being heard loud and here, clear here in Australia. So that's amazing. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, we are at, at the moment here in Berkeley. Uh, sorry, here in Australia. And there in Berkeley, um, the you could say the uh, the angel of the the dark angel of COVID has passed Queensland by by and large to date. Now things can change. We hope not. But um, if you're needing hospital care in the state of Utah, the state of Alaska, um, the doctors have to choose to ration their care to who needs it most because there's no beds. Uh, in the state of Alaska now, uh, ICU bed capacity is at 125%. That is to say they pitched beds into parking lots, into uh, corridors. So it's a dark time. Uh, the medical, the healthcare systems in, in the United States have by and large collapsed. Uh, in many states, because people have not gotten vaccinated. Um, those who got vaccinated are not 
in the hospital uh, by and large. So uh, clearly the message is just trust science. Science won't let you down in this case. And uh, for those folks who are courageously providing the care, it's a hard time. People are beyond exhaustion. Um, so I want to share uh, Janice Ian's uh, tune that gives strength called Better Times Will Come. And after uh, Janice's song, I'm going to go right into the uh, Medicine Buddha Mantra, which is here. Thank everyone for joining. This is our transference, but we're going to do the Janice Ian's Better Times song. Put our hearts in it. This is one of those songs that really chases the blues. Better times, better times will come better times better times will come when this world learns to live as one oh better times will come chinese says ming tian ming tian wei gong hao ming tian ming tian wei gong hao shi jie wu xie xing da tong when we greet each dawn without fear, knowing loved ones soon will be near. When the winds of war cannot blow anymore, oh, better times will come. Try that again. Mian dui kunan, hao bu wei ju, qin pang hao yo. Chorus. Better times, better times will come, better times, better times will come. When this world learns to live as one, oh, better times will come. Though we live each day as our last, we know someday soon it will pass. We will dance, we will sing in that never-ending spring. Oh, better times will come. Ming Tian, Ming Tian Wei Gong Hao, Ming Tian, Ming Tian Wei Gong Hao. Last chance, better times, better times will come, better times, better times will come. This world learns to live as one, oh, better times will come, oh, better times will come. And transfer the merit, please. Wherever you would like that better time to come, here's your chance. We'll do it with Medicine Buddha's mantra.
picture of Buddhas here at the city of 10,000 Buddhas. I'd like to invite you to bow with me if you care to. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. And here we have a picture of our founder and our guiding light, Animal Master Shrinhua, make three bows. Second bow. bow. Thanks for joining, friends. Do check out the Parliament of World's Religions. We'll see you all next week for the, the last of the Bodhisattva's great bows. Amitofo. See you then. Bye bye.